you know, people have wondered sometimes and they've asked me, you know, where's the superego and the ego and the id located in the brain? And, you know, it's a stupid question and it's not a stupid question at the same time. Um, it's actually a useful question at one level of analysis because you could say, well, the id from the Freudian perspective is sort of the, the natural force that propels motivation, you know, and and it's, when we say motivation, we're not saying much different than saying id, by the way. You know, it's the same kind of low resolution word. And it's clearly the case that we have fundamental motivational systems and that we do share them with animals and that they do drive our behavior, you know, but they also drive our perceptions in all the ways that Freud thought about, you know. And one of the things I really like about the psychoanalyst is that they, they, they never make the mistake of assuming that a motivational system or an emotional system is a mechanical system that reacts deterministically. They say, no, those things are like personalities. And that's that's much more sophisticated viewpoint than the typical behaviorist or the typical cognitive psychologist, you know, because they tend to think of the computer in either stimulus response terms, so it's basically deterministic chains, or as if the, the, the information processing system is a computational apparatus, which it is, but it's not only that, you know, it's an embodied computational apparatus and the body is a very sophisticated thing. You know, it's, it's been very difficult for us to build embodied robots. And it's also the case that until you build embodied robots, the things don't really get smart. You know, you, you have to have a body for the thing to actually have any intelligence. And that was actually figured out by a robotics engineer named Rodney Brooks back in the 1990s, 92, 93. He published a couple of papers on that saying, you know, that if we were going to build artificial intelligence, we shouldn't start from the top down. We shouldn't build a world modeling machine and then embed it in something that moves around. We should build something that sort of moves around semi-autonomously like a stupid insect. And insects aren't stupid. So I do mean a stupid insect. And if we could manage that, we'd really be doing something. You know, and I think we've, we might have got beyond the stupid insect level of, of robots so far. Um, and, you know, it's starting to ramp up really fast, but it's in, in large part because the things are embodied. And so, because it is the case, as, as we've discussed, that your, your perceptual, your cognitive perceptual motor systems have to be embedded in an output system that can interact with the world in order for them to be doing anything that's actual or real. So... So anyways, back to the hypothalamus. Um, roughly speaking, and I'm no expert on hypothalamic function and I had to pound my way through Swanson's paper because it's quite complex, you know, but the hypothalamus is sort of the nexus between the, the brain, the mind and the body. That's one way of thinking about it. And it's very good at monitoring your body, the states of your body, and it can figure out basically when your blood sugar is too low and when you need water and when you, I don't exactly remember how it's uh, associated with the regulation of breathing because I suspect that that's a different system and I don't remember that being a subcomponent of the hypothalamus, but it does also regulate things like sexual behavior and sex, sexual attraction and temperature regulation and excretion and, and you know, all the things that you would associate with the basic biological functions that come along with being a complex animal. And, you know, we share those functions way down the evolutionary chain. You know, we share a lot of the functions with everything that moves, approach and avoidance, we share with pretty much everything that moves. And by the time you get to the higher mammalian functions, you know, we share those with pretty much all mammals. That's partly why we can understand mammals pretty well. You know, it's, you can kind of have a lizard as a pet and some of them are more social than others. But, you know, to really have a pet, it has to be a mammal. And it's even better if it's a social mammal, like a, like a dog, because, you know, you can understand dogs and they can understand you because they're hierarchical animals and they have the same, roughly, the same set of biological functions that you do. You know, their brains are organized around smell and not around vision. And almost all animals are like that, except for people and maybe hunting birds, you know. So that's one thing that really distinguishes us from dogs. But we're similar enough in our body behavior so that we can directly relate to dogs and you know they can even play and play is a circuit so there's a guy named Jaak Panksepp J-A-A-K Panksepp P-A-N-K-S-E-P-P -P, who I would roundly recommend that you read if you're interested in 
in behavioral neuroscience, I think he's a genius. He's sort of on par with Gray, as far as I'm concerned, and on par with Swanson. And Pagsep, I, I believe, discovered the play circuit in mammals. And so, you know, two thumbs up for him. That's a big deal. That's kind of like discovering a continent from the psychological perspective. And it's a, cir it's a circuit that's separate from exploration, which is kind of interesting because you think about play as a form of exploratory behavior, but it's sufficiently different from from standard exploratory behavior that it has a circuit that's devoted to it. And there's a lot of primary circuits, you know, and they're networked in with the rest of the brain. And obviously circuit is a, you know, a metaphor. So I could say there's a lot of primary sub personalities. They're like one eyed monsters. There's only one thing they're after, you know, and there's a whole bunch of them. And so roughly speaking, they regulate the, the things already mentioned that the hypothalamus regulates defensive aggression, sexual behavior, temperature regulation, food and water intake, excretion, well then there's one for breathing, then there's another for pain, then there's another for anxiety, um, and there's another for exploration. And there's others, there's sensory modules as well, you know, there's a visual circuit and an auditory circuit and an olfactory circuit and a circuit that's devoted to taste, and, and there's a circuit that keeps track of how your body is localized in space that's a parietal circuit and um what else is important oh yeah there's a circuit that you can use to abstractly model perceptual structures and patterns of behavior before you implement them in the world and that seems to be a higher cortical function fundamentally and you associate that with the contents of your consciousness there's a language circuit um there, oh yeah there's an empathy circuit that mediates maternal behavior there's a hunting circuit that mediates predatory behavior. Um, there's a circuit to check dominance and subordinate, subordination. Um, there's a circuit that mediates creativity in human beings. There's a circuit that mediates social activity so, and, and the, the positive reinforcing nature of social activity. And that's quite tightly associated with the exploratory circuit. Um, well, that's, you know, that's not too bad for a beginning. I'm sure I've missed some and I'll remember them, but, and each of those subsystems is important enough so that there's a neural architecture devoted to it. Now, some of those neural architectures are flexible enough so that if they don't develop in one brain area, they'll develop in another. So it's, it's not exactly as if the location of these functions is specifically determined in advance before development. So for example, if you have a baby and it has, you know, epilepsy, and if the epilepsy is really bad, sometimes they'll take out the whole left or right hemisphere. And if they do that early enough, it doesn't really seem to have much consequence for the baby, you know, which is pretty weird. You think, well, half the brain, that's probably fairly useful. But in some sense, it's as if the cortical elements of the brain are territory that can be inhabited and colonized by the lower levels of the brain. And so you could say that the lower levels of the brain, including the visual input systems, would just as soon colonize what we call the visual cortex. But if there's no visual cortex because it's being removed, then they'll just go colonize part of the auditory cortex.